All right, so full disclosure, uh, how the exam went on Monday. Um, that's, that's the distribution after the curve. So before the curve, the mean was about 72. Um, after now that most of the people have taken it, uh, per, the mean was about 75. So um, I may, uh, I'm gonna, look closely at the ones that people missed uh, for Monday and we may go over a few of them in class if I think that uh, I need to clear up any misconceptions uh, and about things that will help you for the final. Uh, but there's a lot to cover in the next uh, couple of le three lectures here. So uh, we'll see what we have time for. Uh, there was a student that got them all right. So uh, it, it can be done, <laughs> okay. So, so let's move on. I, I know a lot of people are eager to talk about the final or hear about what that's gonna look like. Uh, it is Monday. Um, if you have three or more finals on one day, then you're, it's reasonable to get one of those uh, changed. So if you have three finals on Monday, come to me and I'll let you take that on a different day. Um, if you work all weekend and have two finals on Monday, no, <laughs> like you've known when the final exam was all, all semester. So, you know, get that time off if you can. Um, note that it starts at noon. So don't come at 1.30 like you normally do. Please, please come at noon. Uh, it is a longer test than what we're used to. You have an hour and 50 minutes to do that. Uh, it's split up into thirds. Okay, so the first third of the exam will be the new material. So that's a, not quite four lectures worth of material of these pathogens here that we're talking about, streptococcus through whatever we get through at the end of next Wednesday. Um, that's gonna be about 45 questions, so a little bit less than a regular exam. Um, that's the part, this is the part that I would encourage you to spend most of your time studying. The recent stuff, because you know I'm gonna ask three or four, five questions about streptococcus. So make sure you know that material. Um, then the cumulative portion is, is split up into two parts. So there's a multiple choice cumulative portion, which will be less. So less questions, but there will be questions about, you know, through, throughout the whole semester. Um, I try to ask things that, you know, uh, have been kind of major themes or when I say things like, oh, remember, we talked about this before. So those are the kinds of things that I especially like to ask. Um, the part that students usually do the best on is the third part, matching of terms. So this is the largest part and it's just terms from all semester. Okay. so. Here's an example, let me skip this and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Here's an example of what that matching will look like. Okay, and, and I posted this. Um, so there'll be somewhere between 12 and 15 questions on each page and, and some of the pages I have one extra distractor. Some of, I think the last page, there's the same number. Okay, so if you, if you look at these terms and I won't, use any of these exact terms, but there's things, you know, like plasmid and lag phase. Okay, those are totally different things. If you just kind of know the basis, basics of what it is, you have a good chance of getting that right. Sometimes there'll be two closely related terms and you gotta know the difference between them. Okay, but uh, again, you, you shouldn't be pressed for time. You may need to pace yourself a little bit better than what some of you have been doing for the, for the other exams, but um, where, how do you study for this? 
uh, at the end of every chapter, there's bold faced terms. That's somewhere to start, especially those chapters where we've, we've covered most uh, everything from the book. So that's somewhere to start. Um, and just kind of going back through your notes and paying particular attention to make sure you kind of understand terms. Um, here, here is a list of the pathogens that I'm hoping to get through uh, by the end of Wednesday. So we have, we have some work to do here. Uh, we've done streptococcus. We're partway through anthrax. Um, I have learning objectives for uh, Bordetella. That's whooping cough. I don't think we're going to get to that. So um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll post the, the learning object, the updated learning objectives um when i have a better idea of exactly what we'll get to and what we won't um but i'm i'm hoping to i had an updated version of this and that did not make my sheet here um uh i'm hoping i think that we'll get to all these things except whooping cough um i'm also hoping to uh get to rabies next week and in order to do that i may cut back on the covid stuff a little bit like I'm kind of tired of talking about COVID, right? So there's probably, there's, there's maybe a few drugs that we'll talk about that are new and we may just kind of cut back some of that stuff. So uh, I'm hoping to get to rabies. Again, I'll send an updated uh, learning objective uh, list out. Uh, so for these pathogens, think about, you know, kind of what they look like, what's their shape, or what's their gram reaction? Uh, if, if they're a virus, what kind of virus are they? DNA or RNA? Um, what we'll talk about different disease manifestations. That's probably the most recognizable things. Occasionally you might get something mixed up with something else, but uh, the virulence factors are probably what's you know less you, you have, might have to study a little bit more. Um, again, what things make those pathogens successful? Um, any treatment, sometimes I go into a little more depth on that than others. Sometimes we just say um, antibiotics. Um, is there a vaccine? Uh, recognize the name of that vaccine and what kind of vaccine it is. Okay. So that's just kind of, kind of the main things that you want to focus on for, for the pathogens that we talk about. Uh, in terms of that cumulative material, I won't ask any history questions like you know, the names of people that we talked about at the very beginning. Um, I'm not gonna talk about specific antibiotics. So you don't have to remember how vancomycin works or isoniazid or whatever. Um, but you do need to know just kind of the basic terminology, like what's it mean if an antibiotic is broad spectrum, for instance. Uh, so just kind of basics there. I won't get into any specific antimicrobial chemicals like iodine or glutaraldehyde. Um, we, won't, we won't worry about those. So focus on kind of the big picture things like microbial structure, metabolism, genetics. Hopefully the immunology is still pretty fresh in your mind. Um, infection. So, you know, when I look at... The questions that I typically ask, and I have not tweaked my exam for this year yet, those are the things that I tend to kind of focus on. So I know that's kind of a big ask, but again, that multiple choice section is the smallest section. And then I talked about that matching already, okay? So as you think of any questions about the final, don't be afraid to ask. Any burning questions right now? Okay. All right, so we have finished Streptococcus. Uh, we're still talking about gram-positive pathogens. So this is in chapter 19. So sorry if I was a little bit confusing about that homework and when it was due, but that all of chapter 19 homework that includes the Staphylococcus is, is due the day of the final. And there's not, it's not, this is not a too homework heavy, really um, part of the semester. I guess it's not uh, typically a, a lot of homework I would consider. Um, so, and then we were talking about the gram positive rod shaped organisms, Bacillus. Uh, we'll talk about uh, briefly Clostridium today as well. Um, anthrax is really one of the only Bacillus that causes any disease at all, Bacillus anthracis. So, we talked about some little, some few virulence factors there. Uh, remember, this is considered a zoonotic infection, so humans only get it really 
uh, mostly only get it when they're in some close um, contact with animals. Uh, and in this country, our animals are, uh, it's not common to have anthrax spores in the soil. So for the most part, uh, either our animals are vaccinated or um, free of, of anthrax. So it's, it's really uncommon in this country. Um, cutaneous anthrax is probably the most common kind. Remember that's when the spores get into some wound. Um, I noticed that when I look back through these that my hand, handwriting is really poor and I also tend to misspell things. So bear with me there. That's supposed to say systemic. Um, unless that toxin uh, goes systemic, it, again, this is usually clears up on its own, maybe scar where that S scar has been, that, that black necrotic tissue. Uh, the kind of anthrax that you don't want to get is pulmonary also called inhalation anthrax or gastrointestinal anthrax. So remember, different disease manifestation depending on the portal of entry. So uh, if it's in a wound, not too serious. If you inhale it, um, close to 99.9% .9 death if it's not treated. And the earlier we treat this, the better. So this is um, the kind of anthrax that 11 people were sickened with back at 9-11 when spores, anthrax spores were, were mailed to Congress. Uh, five of those people died. So five out of the 11 that were sick. Uh, this is also known as wool sorters disease. So, you know, back in the day, again, people that were close closely worked with sheep during shearing, the, those spores could get aerosolized. Uh, people have got pulmonary anthrax just from working with, um, there was a shipment of wool that came from somewhere overseas, uh, the US that people got anthrax from. Uh, but again, this is when the, the endospores are inhaled. Uh, and there's two phases of the disease. So remember, most diseases have some incubation period where there's no symptoms. For, for inhalation and flat packs, that's somewhere between one and six days. Uh, and then a prodromal phase where the patient has really mild symptoms. Um, what does that look like for anthrax? Uh, considered to be flu-like symptoms. So things like uh, fever, kind of malaise. Kind of achiness. And that might last for a couple of days. Um, if you get treatment then, then typically patients going to be recover fine. Uh, but then that moves into an invasive phase, which uh, is also known as the illness phase when the signs and symptoms are going to be the worst. Uh, patients have a really high fever. Uh, remember, there was a couple of toxins that were released. One of those was edema toxin. Uh, so basically, we're getting uh, pulmonary edema, so lots of fluid in the lungs. If you took a chest x-ray of somebody at this point, we have this. Uh, this is called a, a metastinal widening. So that center of the thoracic cavity is filling up with fluids. So this looks, oh, this whitish part here is a lot whiter than what it's supposed to be. Um, all those, uh, so those toxins are, are uh, going, getting out into the tissues with that, uh, with that fluid, with that swelling. Um, that can cause, uh, you know, that's lot, lots of that inflammation can cause the patient to go into shock. Blood pressure goes way down. Um, there's a, that other toxin, lethal, lethal toxin, is especially acting on macrophages. And remember, macrophages are important to process and present antigen to get the adaptive immune cells uh, activated. So when that presenting doesn't happen, the adaptive immunity doesn't really kick in. Okay, so almost always fatal if it's not treated. Even if it is, again, the later, the worse the prognosis is. Okay. Uh, and and all, pretty much as bad as inhalation anthrax is when those spores are ingested, when we eat them. 
So this doesn't happen very commonly for humans. If we ate an animal that wasn't infected with anthrax, then that's what would happen. But uh, typically this is the way um, animals are gonna contract because they are eating you know, things off the ground and the spores are in the ground. Okay, so um, this causes just a little different target tissues. So we got hemorrhaging and, and necrosis. Remember, necrosis just means death of tissues in the intestines. Uh, severe ascites, okay, that just means abdominal swelling. Okay, or um, ascites is, um, I'm not sure if that's just, uh, yeah, fluid accumulation in the peritoneal cavity. So abdominal swelling. I couldn't find a good picture of that, unfortunately. I guess it's pretty rare in humans. Uh, but again, near 100% mortality if we don't treat it. So what do we do to treat it? Um, I decided not to go into the different antibiotics because I think that kind of changes or, you know, it's kind of up to doctor's discretion, but there's different antibiotics that uh, are given. Um, even if somebody is suspected to have been in contact uh, then they'll give that person antibiotics even before they have symptoms. So we we'll say that's prophylactically. Uh, remember the antibiotics though are not going to have any effect on the toxins that are short circulating and that's the main problem. So um, now we, we do have, this is kind of a newer thing. We can give monoclonal antibodies in order to neutralize the toxins. So hopefully we're little better position if you know there is some kind of biological attack um hopefully again we'd be a little bit better at, at treating it but um that's that's the main issue that uh, we even talk about anthrax there's usually only a, on average about one person in the u.s that gets anthrax uh, every year it's a little bit more prevalent globally in some areas but uh, again there's always that kind of bioterrorist threat do we have a vaccine? Uh, we have a very good X vaccine in animals. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a good vaccine in humans. Um, it's a series of, uh, I think it's five shots within 18 months that humans have to get. Um, it's called AVA. So anthrax, uh vaccine absorbed uh, and that's um i believe it's considered a subunit vaccine in other words it's it's acellular it's just basically a protein uh on the surface of the bacilli that uh, causes an immune response um, and again, we have to give this in many different doses. There's a fairly high percentage of people that get that vaccine, about 1% that have fairly serious neurological complications. So we only give this to like people that are doing research with anthrax, or I don't know if maybe vets uh, would take this. Uh, people in the military that are going to the Middle East where anthrax is a little bit more common. Um, I don't believe that they force that on people anymore. People were saying, no, I don't want to be deployed there because of, I don't want to get the anthrax vaccine. So I think there's some little changing opinion on that. But uh, we could use a better vaccine. <laughs> okay, so hopefully it won't be something that's ever absolutely needed. All right, questions about anthrax? All right, so the other gram positive bacilli uh, that's that's very common is are the clostridium. So again, these are gram positive rods. And like the uh, bacillus, they are also endospore producers. So that's kind of what makes them uh, very interesting to us, you could say, uh, and sort of unusual. Kind of changed the order that I was presenting everything. So I had notes are all out of order, okay. So what makes these different from the bacilli is that they are primarily anaerobes, where the bacillus are kind of common soil organism, uh, often aerobic. Uh, 
bacillus are catalase positive, clostridium catalase negative. All right. So some of them are strict anaerobes, some of them are more aero tolerant. Um, we find them just in the soil, sewage, vegetative debris. So uh, they're saprobes. So if you remember that term, uh, that just basically means they're decomposers. They're living on um, dead organic matter. Okay, that's what they use for their nutrients, dead or organic matter. Okay. Um, I can remember that when I was an undergrad doing microbiology lab, one of our tasks was we had to isolate clostridium uh, from some environmental source. And so our professors brought in horse manure and we had to treat horse manure on some plates. And let me tell you that did not smell very good in the lab, <laughs> having a bunch of vials of horse manure. So uh, again, animals, uh, feces of animals, um, as well as uh, we have some clostridia as normal flora in our large intestine as well. Okay, so, so there's some really cool organisms in this genus that, that cause really nasty infections, things like clostridium tetani, uh, positive agent of tetanus. That's why you probably get a tetanus shot hopefully every 10 years or so. Clostridium perfringens is the causative agent of gas gangrene. So a common infection in kind of really deep, deep wounds, puncture wounds, gunshots, that sort of thing. Uh, Clostridium botulinum, causative agent of botulism, potentially fatal food poisoning. Most common when people don't can their goods from their garden correctly. Um, but we are gonna not really go into any of those in depth. Uh, uh, some, some semesters I have time for that. I don't think I do this semester, but I do wanna mention Clostridium difficile because that's the Clostridium that you are more likely to come in contact with uh, working, working in the hospitals. Uh, that's the causative agent of, we just call the infection basically the, the organism, we just call it C. diff. Okay, so uh, let's talk uh, just a few minutes about uh, C. diff. Some of us have it as normal microbiota in our large intestine. So uh, somewhere between like 30, 40, 50% of us maybe have it in our colon right now. So it's considered an opportunist. It doesn't cause any problems if we are otherwise healthy and really don't have any of these risk factors. Uh, the main risk factor being that someone is on a course of antibiotics. And the longer and more powerful antibiotics that you're on, the more you're at risk of getting C. diff uh, because it just, those antibiotics knock down the variability uh, of our normal microbiota in our large intestine. And then that can cause the C. diff to kind of overgrow and take over. Uh, so it's not just people in hospitals or old people in nursing homes that get C. diff. I've talked to college students that have had C. diff, uh, but you are more at risk, again, if you're older, um, if you have recently been in a hospital or a nursing home. So basically you're weakened probably from something else, um, weakened immune system. Um, or if you've had C. diff before, then you are a little bit more likely to get it again. Um, and how do you, how does it transmit? Um, well, the spores are, are spread in the feces. So this is kind of the one exception. Remember I said that organisms that sporulate usually do so in the environment. Okay, they make capsules when they're in our body and then they sporulate when they're in the environment. This is the one example of that. This organism makes spores when it's in our body and then those are passed with the feces. So if you've you know, been, had to clean up maybe after a patient that had C. diff, you probably had the gown up and glove and everything really tight. That, that is to some extent to protect you, but also to protect, keep you from carrying it to the next person that you care for. Because you, know, you if you haven't been on antibiotics, you know, you're not likely to have a problem because again, it will kind of get out competed in your colon, but you don't want to carry it to somebody else. Uh, so, all right. So what, what does C. diff cause? It causes a very persistent diarrhea. Uh, 
uh, a very watery diarrhea that kind of goes on and on and on. And it's hard uh, for patients to get rid of it. Uh, sometimes that diarrhea is so, so severe that it's considered pseudomembranous colitis. So here's a picture from an endoscope of, of what that looks like. You can see the ulceration uh, in, in the large intestine uh, due to the lots of inflammation. Um, and sometimes that ulceration is so bad that uh, the large intestine gets perforated. And then you, uh, you know, the bacteria that's normally contained within your large intestine spills out and that's not good. Uh, so a few toxins that the C. diff produces, Toxin A is an enterotoxin. So remember, this is an exotoxin that is acts um, on the intestines, uh, makes the stool more watery. And then toxin B is, is a cytotoxin that's just acting to kill those cells of that uh, epithelial mucous membrane of, in the large intestine. Uh, okay. Um, so, what, what do we do about it? Um, usually the first thing that uh, doctors will try is a course of vancomycin. Uh, and that's a uh, cell wall inhibitor. We talked about that one, it works on gram positives. Usually that's an uh, antibiotic that you have to give uh, by IV. This is the one case where it will work if you give it orally because that way it gets to the large intestine where it needs to be. Um, and sometimes that will clear up the C. diff, just taking some antibiotics. We always try that first because it's the easiest thing. Um, there, are, there is lots of bacterial resistance uh, for C. diff to antibiotics. So oftentimes that doesn't work and it becomes kind of a chronic thing. So another treatment that is, I think, gain, I would say that it's gaining acceptance, but it hasn't been approved by the FDA yet. It's still considered experimental. Um, is what's abbreviated FMT. So that stands for fecal microbiota transplant. All right, so it sounds gross, but the idea is you take a donor's feces and you get that in the patient's large intestine in order to repopulate the large intestine with all those uh, species that hopefully will outcompete uh, the C. diff. So uh, usually they get a family member to do that. Sometimes they will transplant it with uh, an endoscope. Um, now they have that in pill form. They used to have to, uh, of course, they would freeze the pills because there's live organisms in there. And they used to have to use clear capsules because that was the only kind of capsule that was manufactured that would uh, break down at sort of the right point in digestion. So if you can imagine taking, you know, 20 of these pills a day for a number of days, uh, you know, it, it would be kind of gross to do that. Um, now it's a little bit more palatable. They have some other kinds of capsules that, that make that a little bit easier to, to do. Uh, but they usually take a family member that's screened very carefully uh, make sure they don't have a number of, you know, diseases, uh, and usually use them as a, um, as a donor. Uh, but there is a company, I think it's in Massachusetts, that pays people to donate feces. So, you know, if you give plasma, uh, you know, maybe this would be another thing that you could do uh, to make some extra money. Um, I think right now you have to live near the, the company in Massachusetts. I don't think you can send it to them, but that hope it may become more prevalent in the future because this has um, almost a 99% success rate uh, for, for people that, you know, again, have this chronically and haven't been able to get rid of it any other way. Question? Yes, yeah, so there's feces in the pill. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I can't imagine that it's that palatable. Yeah. Ah, uh, so good question. Have there been cases where they transmitted disease? Um, that has been a, 
a problem and what has set it back quite a bit because there were a number of cases of people that actually got a antibiotic resistant infection from their feces donor and one person died from that. So we are learning about things. It was just something that hadn't been screened for before. So we are learning the things that we have to screen for and hopefully we'll get better and better at that. So yeah, thanks for asking. All right, so um, I, I assume a number of you have dealt with patients with C. diff. You're supposed to be able to maybe even tell whether somebody has it or not by the smell of it. Um, it's a really nasty infection, but then, but yeah. The, the smell is due to the type of bacterial fermentation that the organism does. So it's just these organic products that are kind of left over from its metabolism that have that really distinctive whiff, whiff of the death. So, all right, good stuff. We gotta move on, okay. All right, so... Mycobacterium. So this is still contained uh, in chapter 19 uh, of your book, um, which that chapter is supposed to be gram positive pathogens. Uh, hopefully, if you remember, we talked about mycobacterium at the beginning of the semester. Uh, we, we more often will consider these organisms acid fast and not really gram positive or gram negative either one. They're kind of their own little group. They put them in the gram positive chapter because they don't have an outer membrane. So we, we definitely won't call them gram negatives. Okay. Um, there's actually a, a lot of different species of mycobacterium. Um, there's a few that are, that are more famous, more common. Uh, mycobacterium leprae causes the disease known as leprosy. So that's what this picture is showing here. There's actually a couple different kinds of leprosy. There's one kind that's just kind of a skin infection. Uh, the other kind is infecting the nerve endings and basically makes your extremities fall off. So uh, it's, and then patients usually die from those sores when their fingers and their toes and their ears and their nose and lips fall off. Um, I, was, I was just reading more about that because there was a leper colony in, in Hawaii that I was reading about. It was really interesting. It was uh, just a devastating uh, disease. It's very treatable now. Um, you know, once your body parts stop, start falling off, you can't bring those back, but it, it is still, it is quite treatable. Uh, Mycobacterium bovis is uh, bovine TV. So not just cows, uh, but things like elk, moose, uh, Cows can contract uh, bovine TB. Uh, humans used to get mycobacterium bovis when we would drink unpasteurized milk. So that was one of the things that was very common before we pasteurized our, our milk supply. Um, but the, the main pathogen that we'll spend the most time on here is mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, causative agent of TB, also uh, used to be known as consumption because it would uh, kind of consume people, uh, consume their whole health, I guess. Um, and this is a this is a human pathogen. So uh, when humans get Mycobacterium bovis, it's kind of a uh, milder form of kind of full blown TB. Uh, and when we first came out with antibiotics that would work against TB in late 1940s, we thought this was going to be eradicated in a number of years. Quite the opposite. Uh, now it's estimated somewhere between one in three and one in four people worldwide are infected with tuberculosis. That doesn't mean they have active infections. It's, it's kind of a complicated disease. So we'll talk about that. Um, probably most of those people are, have a latent infection, but it could become active. Um, so, and it does still kill uh, on the order of close to 2 million people globally per year. Um, in the US, it's more like 10,000 people a year get TB, but it's, it's not a, a huge problem in the US. It's areas of the world like Sub-Saharan Africa, 
uh, India, Southeast Asia that just have a enormous prop tuberculosis problem. So it's still out there. <laughs> we haven't eradicated it. Um, we are making progress towards eradication. Um, we had kind of a, a this corresponds with, with the AIDS epidemic where we had uh, more TB when we had untreated HIV. Uh, cases have been getting lower and lower since then. Uh, but again, we're, we're nowhere near absolutely getting rid of it. It's a very difficult, it's turned out to be a very difficult disease to treat. And there's lots of resistance to antibiotics out there. So uh, we probably won't be getting there anytime soon. Okay, so uh, epidemiology, so occurrence of TB, how is it passed around? Uh, humans are the only reservoir. And again, that's for, uh, so remember a reservoir is, is somewhere in nature that the organism is maintained. So again, this is mycobacterium tuberculosis. I'm not talking about mycobacterium bovis. Okay, so that's another reason that we thought we were gonna eradicate it because it's just humans passing it around to humans. Uh, but transmission is airborne. So, you know, the worry, you know, when people are in enclosed spaces with one another, then it's more likely for a person that's sick to pass it on to somebody else. It's actually not uh, transmitted very efficiently. Like, you're really not likely to get it, even if you're right next to somebody with it, surprisingly enough. Uh, what makes you more likely to get TB? Uh, if you've got HIV that's not being treated. So, um, your, your immune system is depressed. Um, anybody that's living in a congregate setting, like a jail, for example, or um, I don't know, college dorms maybe, although you're not uh, probably the age group that would be more, more likely to get it. Um, anybody that's kind of uh, maybe malnourished. Uh, if you're diabetic, then you are a little bit more likely to contract TB and it's likely to be more serious if you do get it because the organism can uh, apparently monkey with the, the glucose tolerance. Um, let's see. Cause it can cause impaired glucose tolerance. So uh, those are not two things, diabetic, being diabetic and having TB at the same time are things that, uh, again, it's not going to be not going to be a good situation. Uh, virulence factors uh, for the organism. So uh, the main one is the acid bath cell walls. Uh, so remember, since uh, some of you are going to have your lab final next week, a nice time to review here. Remember, we had a special acid bath stain in lab. So the mycobacterium are gonna stain pink. Remember what stain that we use there? I'm gonna stare at my lab people. Car carbal fusion, good guess. Carbal fusion, remember it has that phenol in it that's going to adhere to that mycolic acid. That's that main ingredient. Uh, there are other things in there that are distinct about an acid bath cell wall, uh, but that carbal fusion, Again, you don't need to know that for lectures, just helping out lab people will we'll be able to penetrate through that, that cell wall uh, where a water-based dye, like what's in gram stating, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to penetrate through. Uh, and bind to that cell wall, uh, organisms that are not acid fast will take up a blue color, uh, and that's due to the methylene blue that we add after we really decolorize it hard with that acid dissolved in acetone, okay? So um, an organism that, uh, that acid fast cell wall, again, it's, its main virulence factor. Um, it helps it survive really well when it gets um, ingested, phagocytized by say a macrophage. So it, it gets ingested, but then because of that, that really tough lipid waxy cell wall, um, it's resistant to those uh, enzymes that are brought in by the lysosome. Um, 
in the environment, it's going to be res really resistant to drying out. So a mycobacterium may be on some surface can stay viable for weeks because of that cell wall. Um, things that we would use to disinfect or you know, clean it are, we have to use something that's pretty strong to penetrate through that. Uh, in our bodies, so when we're trying to take antibiotics to get rid of it, we don't have as many antibiotics that can get to the inside of, of that mycobacterium that will penetrate through that, that cell wall. So uh, it, it's just harder in general to kill and compounding that, it, it's, it grows slow. Anything that grows really slow is gonna die really slow as well. So patients have to be on antibiotics for six months, 12 months, sometimes 18 months, and those have unpleasant side effects. So uh, it's really kind of hard to kill. So we'll say slow to, slow to kill them as well as, uh, when we try to grow mycobacterium tuber tuberculosis in the lab, it takes um, a number of weeks in order to get it to grow. Um, I've heard as many as eight weeks to get colonies to grow up. So um, they, are, they are kind of slow. Um, and, and just a couple of other things that I'll kind of mention when, when, you, when you Google virulence factors for micro, mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, it gets really complicated really quickly. And there's a lot of things we don't really understand about why mycobacterium are successful. But we do know that within the cell wall, um, they have this, this glycolipid, so this sugar and lipid, uh, it's called cord factor. And if the mycobacterium don't make cord factor, then they are not able to establish an infection. So we know that that's really important. We don't really understand everything about why that's important, but we know that um, when we stain the cells, the reason they kind of stay it's attached kind of clumped together the way they do. So they're kind of short rod shaped organisms is, is because of this cord factor in, in their cell wall. Um, and we think that that probably impacts uh, the chemotaxis of, of neutrophils. And we don't, I don't really know the mechanism of how it does that. Um, it also, when it, when it does get phagocytized by some kind of macrophage or neutrophil, um, sometimes the lysosome doesn't fuse with the phagosome. So uh, basically the, the mycobacterium tuberculosis are living ideally inside macrophages. So that's, that's where they wanna live, that's where they reproduce and they again have mechanisms to keep them from being killed by those macrophages, okay? Um, and there's, there's other things that we won't mention specifically uh, to prevent the macrophages become, from becoming activated. Um, and to make it so it's not such an acidic environment when it is ingested in that phagosome. So uh, lots of things to help it evade our innate immunity. No toxins, okay? A lot of bacteria uh, ha have, have toxins at their disposal and that doesn't seem to be playing any parts in tuberculosis. All right, so what does the disease look like? Um, it's an infection that can impact lots and lots of areas of the body, but it always starts in the lungs, okay? So a patient inhales uh, these, these live uh, mycobacterium bacilli, uh, and they are going to target the macrophages in uh, the very distal part of our uh, bronchial tubes, the alveoli. Okay, you have lots of macrophages actually uh, associated with those alveoli. And, and the bacteria um, tend to be able to replicate pretty freely there. And patients have kind of mild flu-like symptoms. Okay, so I suppose you could, could kind of consider that the prodromal period. Um, some people, Whatever region, they, they get some presentation by anag uh, of antigen from those macrophages. And some people are able to fight off the infection. Okay, so some people fight off, okay? And they clear the infection from their bodies. 
but that appears to not be the case um, a lot of the time. Um, a lot of the time, our immune system has to kind of settle for a stalemate with the mycobacterium. Uh, so they will form a tubercule. So a tubercle is really, a granuloma is kind of a abnormal aggregate of cells. And in tuberculosis, we give those granulomas a special name. We call them tubercles. Okay, so this is just when, um, so here's, here's a tubercle over here. Inside here, we've got live cells. Uh, so live mycobacterium, and they kind of dip cotton around them. There's lots of dead cells here on the outside. And they deposit some, some collagen around those live cells. So they kind of wall themselves off. Um, and those live cells in the middle uh, go dormant. So that tubercle can sit there in our lungs for long periods of time. Uh, again, it, we haven't fought off the infection, but we haven't cleared it either. So it's kind of a, kind of a stalemate there. Uh, the patient is not infectious at this point. Okay, so they're not coughing out live bacilli, they can't get other people sick. Okay, so you might, in other words, call this latent TB. Uh, and sometimes that inside of that tubercule can develop this kind of cheese-like consistency that we call, refer to as a special kind of necrosis called caseous necrosis. Okay, and I think usually, so why is it cheese-like consistency? Those, those cells can um, start to digest some proteins and fat uh, and give it kind of this, you know, oozy quality. Um, and my understanding that that happens when the TB is beginning to reactivate. Um, your book paints a little different picture and says, oh, well, sometimes it's just like this. So here's some of the... Uh, where they talk about it in your book. I don't know if that helps. So this is, you know, inside the alveoli of the lung. Uh, you can see that kind of yellowish center there that they call caseous necrosis. Um, at some point, and again, this may or may not happen, we think only in about 10% of the people that have that latent tuber tuberculosis, um, those tubercles will rupture. Again, sometimes it, that caseous necrosis happens first and then it ruptures. Um, but now this is considered secondary TB when those tubercles rupture. All right, so that only happens, we think, in about 10% of the people. So the question is, if you have tubercles, if you have latent TB, should you get treated to get rid of those? Okay, that's a, sort of a question that, you know, case by case basis, probably in this country, yes but maybe in some other areas of the world, no, because the patient, that's not likely to progress. Um, but the problem is sometimes it progresses when the patient's health maybe takes a turn for the worse, or you know, maybe they're on some kind of immunosuppressive therapy or something like that. Um, so when it's considered secondary TB, uh, that's when the infection is progressing out of the tubercles and now the patient is infectious. Okay, now they are coughing out live, tuber uh, live bacilli into the air. They probably got some chest pain. Um, it, it's supposed to be a very productive cough, uh, sometimes a bloody cough, um, which will, will get your attention. Uh, and then that will progress into things like uh, fever, chills, night sweats, uh, weight loss, the patient gets pale because their, you know, their oxygen is not, you know, being uh, gotten to all parts of their body uh, good enough. So they get this kind of ghostly light, white pallor. Um, they're, they're tired, okay? And, and that, even, it's still, still treatable when it's that point, but again, sort of like anthrax, longer and longer you wait. And, and this is usually an infection that kind of lasts for a really long time because it's slow growing. 
Um, it can get into the third stage, which is considered disseminated TB. Now it's leaving the lungs and can go to pretty much any area of the body. So it can cause meningitis in the brain. It can cause kidney damage. Um, it can get into the bones. So this, you know, not treated now, it's inevitably usually pretty fatal. Um, and still with treatment at that third stage, maybe 50-50. Fatal. So um, again, it, it's, it's very slow. We used to think that TB was a cancer because it acts so slowly. Um, but uh, again, now we know different. All right. So a complicated infection, likewise complicated to treat as well as to diagnose. So probably a lot of it, if you worked in a hospital, you probably had a tuberculin skin test. That's kind of the way that we screen to see if anybody uh, might potentially have TB, um, some purified protein derivative, PPD, of that tubercle bacilli is um, just kind of uh, injected intradermal, intradermally in your upper, upper arm. And we look for a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. So you have to go back the healthcare provider between 48 and 72 hours, and they will check and see if you've had this reaction. All right, so if you do have a reaction though, that's just the first step. That tells us that either you've had a TB vaccine, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, you have primary TB, um, meaning it's, it's latent in your lungs, or you have an active case of TB, okay? So it could be any of those things. So then the next step is oftentimes getting a chest x-ray just to rule out that you don't have TB, right? And interestingly enough, a student just today told me they had to go get a chest x-ray because they had a positive uh, tuberculosis skin test. Okay, so they look at the x-ray. If they don't see any, any uh, tubercles in there, then they can rule TB out. Um, so, um, that's probably a person that was maybe vaccinated when they were young, and that's why they had a, a positive skin test. Um, but if there are those granulomas present in the lungs, that still doesn't mean necessarily that it's active TB. They can, uh, and it, of course, it could be something else that's, that's wrong. Uh, so typically, then they'll go to doing some microscopy of sputum. So that's something that's been coughed up deep from the lungs, not just a little saliva. Um, and they'll either do an acid bath stain, just like we did in lab, probably more likely to do some direct immunofluorescence. So they'll take a fluorescent dye that's been tagged to an antibody that only recognizes mycolic acid. So then only the mycobacterium will fluoresce when we look at it through a fluorescent microscope. So now if you're seeing bacilli in the sputum, then yes, this is a patient that has active TB. Um, now uh, they are doing some TB blood tests instead of the tuberculin skin test. Uh, the advantage with the blood test is that you can kind of read it really quickly and the patient doesn't have to come back within a set amount of time. It is a little bit more expensive. So um, maybe not in common use, but this is uh, an interferon gamma release assay. So they abbreviate that IGRA. Uh, we talked about interferon before. We talked about alpha and beta interferon, which is released to help control viral infections. It's a different kind of interferon. Type 2 interferon, interferon gamma, uh, gamma is actually released by our T cells when they encounter uh, that tubercule antigen. So they'll take some blood from the patient, uh, mix it in with some TB antigen in the lab, uh, and then test to see if interferon gamma has been released. And if it has, then the patient has um, either, um, ha either has a latent case of TB or active TB. Uh, so the advantage there is that prior vaccination doesn't cause it to be positive. All right, so complicated to diagnose, question. Yes. 
So, right. So the dormant TB, right. So, um, yeah, I think the interferon gamma release assay, assay will detect it if it's dormant too. Yeah. So but then like the there's, I, right. Not the microscopy, right. Not the microscopy, right. No. Yeah. So then the question is, well, do we treat it if it's dormant? What does treatment look like? Uh, it's pretty, it's supposed to be pretty grueling. Uh, of course, streptomycin, we talked about that antibiotic before. That was the first drug that was used to treat TB. Again, a real miracle drug. First thing we had in 1946. Uh, most um, strains of TB are resistant to it now. So it's not commonly used. Plus remember, that was the one that had the ear toxicity. So had to be very careful about using that drug. Um, today, uh, a patient that's newly diagnosed will be put on isoniazid and rifampicin, as well as two other antibiotics. So four different drugs. Um, so it's a lot of pills every day, and they need to be on those drugs for six months. And they really have a lot of uh, side effects that are common. Uh, so things like uh, nausea, uh, headache, fatigue. So the problem is as soon as patients start feeling better, they stop taking their drugs because the drugs make them feel lousy too. Um, so that has contributed probably to the resistance problem. We have a terrible problem uh, with resistance. Um, about somewhere between 10 to 20% of the new cases of TB are actually considered MDR, meaning multiple drug resistant TB. So in that case, that means that this first line that we normally use won't work. Uh, and we have to use some other drugs that maybe have a little worse side effects, like some aminoglycoside or a fluoroquinolone a little bit riskier to use, and patients usually have to be on them for even longer, maybe 12 months, maybe 18 months. And somewhere between one to 3% of new TB, TB cases are XDR, meaning multiple drug resistant, or sorry, extensively drug resistant, where pretty much uh, everything that we normally use doesn't work. So there have been cases where, you know, we're out of antibiotics here. Um, there was a new antibiotic that was approved in 2012 called bedaquiline. It was the first new mechanism that we had to treat PD, uh, TB in about 50 years. Um, it interferes with ATP synthase. Um, so that, I believe, they reserve to use that for any cases that are multiple drug resistant. Uh, uh, and still, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough treatment process you know, lots, lots of pills. Okay. Well, if treatment is so bad, don't we have a vaccine? Uh, yes, we have a vaccine, but it's not a great vaccine. Uh, we just passed the 100 year mark. This came out in 1921. So it's a very old vaccine. It's called Bacillus Calmet Duran, BCG. Uh, Calmet and Duran were the Frenchmen that developed it. Uh, and that just bacill just stands for bacillus. Uh, the mycobacterium is a bacillus shaped organism. So that's where the name came from. It's actually an attenuated vaccine, meaning it's a weakened strain. It's a strain of my mycobacterium bovis that has been grown in cells generation after generation after generation, and it eventually kind of lost its virulence factors. So um, it's, a, it's a weakened strain, one that shouldn't cause disease. Um, how effective is it? It's pretty good in children, um, but it's, uh, you know, that wears off in five or 15 years and it's not as effective in adults. Um, and the drawback is that it's a little bit more complicated to diagnose it if a person has actually had the vaccine. So in this country, it's not given routinely unless somebody lives with somebody that has TB. Um, Again, it's just TB is just not that prevalent here. Uh, so in other countries, though, it is um, given. Um, 
I just saw something from the World Health Organization, the WHO, that said that we, we really need a better vaccine. <laughs> like we can do better than this. So uh, who knows? Maybe that will be on the horizon. All right. Uh, questions about TB. Okay. All right. All right, so let's move on to our gram negative chapters. Um, so in lab, you've worked with a lot of gram negative rods. So I'm not gonna cover any gram negative rods. Um, I used to talk a little bit more about E. coli, but um, I decided to kind of focus on organisms that you haven't had any exposure to through, through lab, and that's a couple of genera of gram negative cacti. All right, so we're kind of used to saying in lab, oh, most of the rods are gram negative and the cocci are gram positive, but there are gram negative cocci. So again, you gram stain them, they stain pink. Um, and the, the gram negative cocci aren't really very common. Uh, there's really only a couple that are clinically very relevant, and that's, that's the Neisseria. Okay. Um, these typically will present as diplococci. All right, so pairs. That's kind of, I looked for a better picture than that. It's not a great picture. Um, it looks like there's some kind of white blood cells surrounding those uh, tiny little Neisseria here in this cell. Uh, so usually present as pairs. Uh, they are, I, I am going to take issue with a few place, a few things that your book says that is kind of contrary to what you read in the literature. Uh, your book calls them non-motile. Uh, it's true that they do not have flagella. I don't know that there's any cocci-shaped cells that, that have flagella. I don't think that there are. Um, but there are different kinds of motility. And sometimes we consider the Neisseria to have a, a twitching motility. Uh, and that means that, it, we'll talk about they have what do you call them, pili or fimbriae? We'll talk about that. Uh, but they reach out their, their pili and grab a hold of surfaces and then will pull themselves closer to that surface. So it's a kind of, it's a variety of pili that are kind of longer and they can use them as kind of a, like a grappling hook to kind of pull themselves closer. So um, whether you consider that real motility or not is sort of up in the air, but sometimes that's called twitching motility. So again, that involves their, their pili. Uh, they're mostly strict aerobes. And one of the reasons that, that we don't grow them is la in lab is because they're fastidious. That just means they're really picky about the conditions that they grow in. It's very difficult to grow them in the lab. They, they need a special kind of media and you know, special concentrations of uh, carbon dioxide and this and that, so they're, they're difficult to grow. Uh, and the two most famous ones, they're, they're also two of the organisms that I have the most difficulty spelling, Neisseria gonorrhea, uh, that's uh, the causative agent of gonorrhea, and Neisseria meningitidis uh, causes meningococcal, meningococcal meningitis. Okay, so those are the two organisms that we're going to talk about in a little bit more depth. Okay, so the Neisseria gonorrhea used to be called gonococcus or genus, and the Neisseria meningitidis used to be called meningococcal, meningococcus. So changed our nomenclature just a little bit there. All right, so gonorrhea. Um, Transmission, I think probably uh, you're all aware of that. It's sexually transmitted. So it's gonna be carried by sperm and bo bo bodily fluid. Okay, so Males are slightly more common. Males that are infected are going to pass that on to females fairly efficiently. It doesn't quite pass quite as efficiently from females to males just because 
of you know where the organism gets gets its ride from basically um, but it can also be transmitted mother to child during birth okay and uh, the most common infection that it causes in newborns is this um, eye infection called gonococcal ophthalm ophthalmia neonatorum. Okay, so let's call that, we can call it an eye infection okay. uh, in newborns. Okay, so that can lead to blindness. So every time there's a newborn baby born in the hospital, we put eye drops on the baby's eyes. Uh, we used to use silver nitrate. Now we use erythromycin, which is a little bit less uh, caustic to the eyes, um, just in case the mother had gonorrhea and didn't know it. Okay, so that's just kind of standard treatment. Those, those eye drops on in newborns, uh, just to keep the baby from, from getting this infection, gonorrhea infection. All right, what are, we'll talk about uh, the symptoms in a minute. What are the virulence factors that are important here? Um, pili, now your book calls it fimbriae. Remember, these are two structures that are both made of the protein pilin. Um, in the past, we have said, oh, if an organism has lots of them around the cell, we call them fimbriae. Usually, if they're pili, there's only one or two. And we talked about the pili being important in that horizontal gene transfer conjugation. Uh, well, there's different kinds of pili. Uh, although your book calls these fimbriae on this organism, when you look in the literature, uh, they're almost always called pili for Neisseria gonorrhea. So I'm going to call them pili. Uh, but again, whichever way. Uh, they're important for attachment. That's their main function uh, to the epithelial cells in that urogenital tract, uh, those, that, those mucosal membranes. Okay, so remember the, the pili that's made of this protein, and there's at the tips of the pili, there's going to be kind of specialized proteins that, again, match exactly to those mucous membranes so that they can attach there really good. Um, and these, uh, the, these pili actually do some really astonishing things in order to outwit our immune system. Um, and, and it's the reason that um, we don't have a good vaccine as well, because the pili are, are the most antigenic part. So like the spikes in the coronavirus, where we have all our vaccines against the spikes, because that's what elicits the immune response. Uh, the proteins in the pili are very antigenic. But the problem is the organism has a way to switch up those proteins just enough to kind of stay ahead of our adaptive immunity. So we call that antigenic variation. So in other words, uh, the composition of those surface proteins on the pili um, you know about every seven days or so so as soon as our adaptive immunity gets antibodies made specific to those proteins they change and then those antibodies aren't any good okay so there are there are other there are other pathogens that can do in its antigenic variation um, flu virus can do it uh, coronavirus does it, but it does it really slowly, kind of over a period of months and months, um, where again, this happens really quickly within one host. Um, HIV uh, is really good at this as well. Okay, so it, it uh, and the mechanism by which that happens is interesting. That's fodder for an upper level class. If you take uh, MedBad tea, then they like to talk about that there. Um, another interesting thing that they can do is phase variation, which um, basically in, in, it means that the pili can detach. Okay, so the gene segment by which the pili are made has kind of an on off switch as to whether it's inserted in the membrane or not. Um, and uh, you might think, well, what's the, what's the, 
advantage to having the pili detached. Um, the good analogy is if you're you're running away from a polar bear, right? What do you do? You throw down your mitten so the polar bear stops to smell the mitten, right? So and then you get away. So you know if 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 the pili detached, our antibodies will follow the pili, and then the bacterium stays intact. It doesn't get phagocytized or whatever. All right. So two things that two wily things that this organism does that has kept us from from making a good vaccine to it. A um, couple other virulence factors. There is an exoenzyme that has kind of a bland name. They just call it protease, uh, but that's an enzyme that helps to cleave the dominant antibody on our mucosal membranes. So remember, that's IgA. So that's secreted on you know, our urogenital tract. Uh, does it have a capsule? <laughs> this is another thing where the book says it does. Uh, everywhere else that I've read will say no. Uh, and that's different than the meningococcal meningitis. Um, that organism does make a capsule and we actually have our vaccine against that capsule. Um, so most everywhere I've read says no. The caveat there is, we can induce this organism to make a capsule if we grow it up, given it certain <laughs> things in the lab. So in the lab, we can make it do that, but we think when it's actually in our bodies that it doesn't make a capsule. Um, and then lastly, lipooligosaccharide, LOS. That should remind you, it's just a variant of LPS. Remember, these are gram negatives. Um, the lipo oligosaccharide just has a little shorter polysaccharide tail than the lipopolysaccharide, which remember is an integral part of that outer membrane of all gram negatives. Okay, so that remember contains lipid A, which remember is the same thing as endotoxin. Okay, so. Um, I like this little uh, graphic in your book here that talks about lipid A and its effects, uh, because this will be really important when we talk about uh, the meningitis as well. So remember, we talked about how when a cell cell's wall breaks down, that's when the endotoxin is released, usually. Um, and that causes um, white blood cells leukocytes to release cytokines. We, we talked about how that can cause their act as pyrogens and cause fever and it can increase inflammation enough that a patient can go into shock if you get too much endotoxin. Um, other effects that we haven't really talked about, it can cause kind of an inappropriate blood clotting. So it's clotting some places where it shouldn't be and not clotting other places where it should be. Um, it can cause this, um, what they call DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. So um, the way that shows up during a meningitis infection is um, a, a, a crazy rash that starts out red and turns black. Okay, so inappropriate blood clotting. Um, I'm not quite sure the mechanism is probably just something that's not directly um, activating complement, um, but uh, again, the complement can uh, contribute to inflammation that contributes to shock. So uh, just remember again that the Neisseria, they're gram negative, so the endotoxin plays a role in its pathology. Okay, so we got a few minutes left. Symptoms. I spared you the graphic pictures here. You can Google that if you want. Uh, males, uh, I've read that it feels like uh, uh, you're peeing fire. That's what I heard that it feels like. Um, some pus filled discharge. It's very painful. And that's really a good thing because males then will seek treatment. And right now we do have good treatment for this. Um, if it's not treated, then it can potentially disseminate into other parts of the body and cause all sorts of kind of strange things you wouldn't associate with gonorrhea, like arthritis, for instance. Um, and it can cause such inflammation that it can cause males to become infertile. So you want to get that treated. 
in females, oftentimes there are no symptoms at all. At least half the time, there's no symptoms. And when there are, it's something that maybe seems more like a yeast infection or a UTI, uh, a little discharge, maybe some painful urination. So sometimes it's not treated right away. And again, that's a problem because uh, it can cause, lead to things like PID, pelvic inflammatory disease, um, abdominal pain, that causes abdominal pain, which um, can also lead to ectopic pregnancies. So a fertilized egg starts to develop outside of the uterus uh, and that can lead to infertility. So uh, we wanna get it treated again, but the problem is a lot of times there's no symptoms. So that's, that's kind of a problem. All right, so we'll finish up next time. I think we're in good, uh, going good here. We'll finish up with gonorrhea and um, get into the viral diseases. So I got some more stuff posted for next week. All right, have a good day, good weekend.